Good afternoon, everyone, and uh, thank you for joining us today for our one-hour webinar on Startigy, a strategy for getting started with cybersecurity. Um, my name is Bill Prone. Uh, I'm Managing Director at Dopkins System Consultants. I'm joined today by Pat Rost, who is a cybersecurity consultant in our IT practice. Um, and we've got a one-hour webinar to introduce you to our Startigy program. Um, quick housekeeping um, statement here is if you've got any questions that come up during the presentation, uh, on, on your go to webinar menu, you'll see a choice that says questions. So just if you type them in there, we'll accumulate them. And then hopefully they'll get answered during the rest of the presentation. If not, we've set aside uh, about 10 minutes at the end to answer the questions that have come in. And uh, I'll make a promise to you that if um, we don't have time to answer all the questions online. We will um, answer them and send out an email to everyone. Um, we are recording this webinar, and all of you will receive an email follow-up with a copy of the recording uh, in probably tomorrow. Um, so with that, um, I'll get started. Uh, introduce quickly Dopkins and company. Uh, many of you may already know us from uh, experience, but Dopkins is a uh, large regional accounting firm in Buffalo. We have over 100 employees. Uh, we've now in our 65th year, uh, having been founded by Leonard Dopkins in 1955. We have five departments in the firm, the assurance department, otherwise known as audit, asset-based lending, consulting, which deals with um, banks and borrowing and financing and credit, uh, our tax advisory services group, Dopkins Wealth Management, which who are investment advisors, and Dopkins System Consultants, which is our um, IT and cybersecurity consulting practice. So one of these things that all of these departments have in common, um, aside from the fact that we're all in one building, is we all deal with risk. And that's a big um, concern for our clients is how do I manage and mitigate risk? So that that's what an audit, uh, a financial audit is, is to try to mitigate the risk of financial concerns or fraud. Um, in the tax advisory department, they're concerned with the risk of um, surprise tax bills or what those issues are. Wealth management obviously is dealing with investment risk. And in our DSC, we're talking about cybersecurity risk. So we do have a common thread. It doesn't, um, it makes some sense in my opinion that um, our consulting practice is part of an accounting firm because it's all part of risk. I, uh, joined the firm 33 years ago. I was hired to create a computer consulting practice. And when I did, my first question was, okay, what does that mean? What do you want me to do? And I was told if I knew what I wanted you to do, I wouldn't need to hire you. So I had to invent a consulting practice. So I can tell you that I came from a large national bank. And so my approach has been from the beginning let me take what a large, say, national bank would do when it comes to IT or security or software, hardware, um, telecommunications, all those things, um, and scale that down as best we can to uh, a smaller organization. So I don't think that a small organization has necessarily less or different needs than a big organization. It's mostly the scale. So that's how we've created um, our IT practice for these last 30 plus years. And most recently, in the last, say, dozen years, where we've been focusing on security, um, we're looking at what would a large healthcare organization, financial institution, government, whatever it is, how would they address cybersecurity 
and how can I take that approach and scale it down to the size of a of a small or medium sized business and that's what um, our strategy program is all about is is to take um, the known and accepted practices of cybersecurity and package them for a small or medium sized business. So as I mentioned, I've been with the firm for oh, 33 years now. Um, a little bit about me, I'm married, I have two grown children and um, something that most of you may not know about me is that I play the bagpipes. And I've played the bagpipes since I was a kid. Um, and I still do. It's a family tradition. So if any of you have ever attended a parade anywhere in Western New York in the last 50 years, you've probably already seen me. Um, but this picture on the screen is is me out of in my civilian garb. So um, with that, I'll take a, a introduce you to Pat Rost, who is a cybersecurity consultant, and uh, he'll tell you a little bit about himself. Thank you, Bill. Welcome, everybody. Um, so like Bill said, I'm Pat Ross. I'm a cybersecurity consultant with Dopkins. Uh, I joined Dopkins in December of last year. Uh, prior to that, I got a bachelor's degree in information technology, uh, majoring in network administration, minoring in information security and insurance from Alfred State College. I have my A+, plus, Net+, plus, and Security+. Plus. Since then, I have over 10 years of experience in the Buffalo area, uh, ranges from help desk and on-site tech uh, support at some of the area's leading IT providers to being a system administrator and IT manager at a local regional nonprofit. Outside of work, uh, I've been a volunteer firefighter in Chittawaga for the past seven years and, and a state certified EMT. So with that, we'd like to get started, but before we do, we have a quick poll. So what is the state of your cybersecurity preparedness? So if everybody could submit their answers, we'll give everybody a little bit of time to get those in. Okay, it looks like we have a few more. We'll give a few more seconds. Okay, so looks like 60% have made good progress looking for ideas to improve, 10% uh, have made no formal progress, 15% have attempted but not much progress, 15 have a formal sustainable program. So range of answers, it looks like a lot of people have at least thought about it, have started it, and are just looking to continue improving, so that's good. So with that, we'll move into uh, the goals of our strategy program and really what we can offer to you. So we're going to educate you and your employees on cyber threats. So that's really to make sure that you're able to address them. And then we're going to aid you in identifying and prioritizing the risks your company faces. And we're going to help you implement sustainable best practices to protect your systems information. We're going to provide relevant continuing awareness education for you and your employees. And we're going to provide you with an ongoing access to cybersecurity specialist to answer questions and help as issues arise. So strategy at a glance. Uh, it is a two-year program. There's been an explanation of why it's a two-year program throughout this webinar. Uh, strategy provides a virtual information security officer. Every company, no matter their size, needs an information security officer. In a larger company, it might be a dedicated position, but in small and medium businesses, it's going to be a portion of an employee's responsibility or maybe even share between multiple people. So in Stargy, we're going to use our experience to fill this role for you. Uh, we also provide an information security risk assessment that will help us identify what is currently the most pressing issue for your company right now. It will aid in guiding us through the, pro through the program. The top 20 plus security issues are addressed. Um, so that will we'll work our way through the, month, the topics month by month. And then 
It also includes an ongoing user training and testing. This training is for all the employees in your company with the goal of reducing the risk they expose to you. So I'm gonna turn it back over to Bill to talk about risk assessment. So the, the first uh, major step in any security program, and Startage is no um, different, is to do an IT risk assessment. Um, what is it? It's a guided analysis of the risks that you and your organization face. We, Dopkins, provide that guidance. You make the decision. So we're not in a position where we can tell you this is a risk you have. You have to decide this is a risk you have. We can tell you what a threat is, but you have to decide that you believe it's a risk worth preventing or mitigating. So what's a risk? Um, easy explanation of a risk is the likelihood that something bad will happen, or if you want a glass half full kind of person, likelihood that something good will not happen. Um, either way, there's a, a ramification or an uh, activity that has an impact on your business. It's either bad or the lack of good. That's the impact. And the likelihood is how, what's the probability that it will happen or how frequently would this happen? And together, that represents a risk. The probability or frequency times the size or impact or ramifications to my business of this thing happening, whatever this thing is. So why would you do a risk assessment? Um, first reason is to literally make a list identifying what it is. What is the enemy you're facing? It's very difficult to protect against something if you haven't been able to name what that something is. So um, just saying I'm afraid of cyber threats doesn't really cut it. You've got to know what I'm trying to protect against. Once you have identified the list, um, we want to prioritize them. They're not all the same. There are bigger risks and there are smaller risks. And perhaps there are ones that aren't a risk at all. And if you're going to spend money, time, resources, effort to protect against them, you'll want to protect against the biggest ones first. So we do want to be able to rank this list. Um, once I have a ranked list of risks, I can use that to justify the cost or the resources that I'm going to expend to protect against it, right? A cost-benefit analysis. Um, it's a really good awareness exercise for your members of your organization to say, oh, I never really thought of that, or I never thought it was a risk, but you're telling me it's a risk in your part of the organization. I see how that makes sense, and people learn and grow from that exercise. Um, it's required by pretty much any um, regulatory organization that deals with cybersecurity. So HIPAA, the Payment Card Industry Data Security Standard, Department of Financial Services, the New York State law governing um, insurance companies and banks, all require a risk assessment. And the main reason there is that most of these regulations say you need to take quote, reasonable steps, unquote. Well, what's the definition of reasonable? It's based on what you determine or assess your risk to be. So it's not reasonable to make you spend a million dollars on something that's not a risk to you. Um, so you have to identify those things. And finally, it's a best practice. It's a, it's a really good start to your strategy. So um, we are going to conduct a risk analysis with your people at your organization. So what exactly is that? So as I said, it's a guided um, brainstorming session, if you will. So what we would do is we would um, lead a discussion considering, let's think first about your hardware. Okay, do you have servers, desktops, laptops, smartphones, IoT, so that's Internet of Things devices, so do you have a a smart thermostat in your company that's connected to the internet, um, fire alarm system that's connected to the internet and part of your network. So what are all the hardware things that could go wrong, could cause a risk? Um, and we want to think about not only equipment that's in use, but equipment that's in storage 
or that we think we disposed of, but it's really just sitting on somebody's desk and it might still have sensitive information on it or be able to be to use to access our network. So we want to think about your hardware. Next thing we want to think about is your software or your data, your information. Do you have payroll data, pension plan data of your employees, credit card information of your of your customers, electronic health records if you're in healthcare or student records if you're in education? Um, what are the kinds of sensitive confidential information that you deal with and what do I need to do to protect it both from a compliance perspective and just a security perspective? And how is this data stored? Is it in the cloud? Do I have it in access databases? Is it on Excel spreadsheets on local C drives? Um, is there Are there Word docs, paper reports? Where does this stuff live? And so we're going to consider all that, and we're going to ask you questions and walk you through that conversation and identify the things that, what, you know, what keeps you up in it? What are you worried about? Oh, I'm worried that someone's going to um, lose a laptop computer on which we have a spreadsheet that has payroll data. Okay, so there's a risk, and we want to identify that and then help categorize it as to um, its impact. Next thing we're going to do, you know, we're going to think about what the rest. So it could be lost, stolen. Um, it could be a power failure. You could have a fire or flood, ransomware. You could have a global pandemic. You could have um, issue with public Wi-Fi, uh, privileged users. You could have an IT person who is disgruntled because he hasn't gotten a raise, so he changes all the passwords and holds your company for ransom till he gets a raise. You know, what are the things that you worry about that could happen. So we want to figure out for this whole brainstorming session, what is the impact on your business if this thing goes wrong? And the impact is not just financial um, or the loss. I mean, if, if somebody loses a laptop, it's not just a $900 laptop that's gone missing. It's what happens when the Buffalo News has a headline that says you lost 30,000 customer records because a laptop was stolen? That's bad publicity. What about the productivity loss of uh, a power failure and your organization can't operate? Or the issues if all of your employees are suddenly working from home and you don't have the technology resources to make that happen? Does, it, our, does my customer service uh, suffer because um, we can't deliver what the customer is asking for? What about the legal or regulatory compliance concerns? So all of these holistic questions go into the impact. So then we're going to ask the question. The, you know, it's all it's all a guess, but it's it's your guess. It's your best uh, feel for how your organization would react. We're going to say. If this event took place, would it be an extreme bet the farm unsurvivable impact or um, a, you know, highly damaging, extremely costly, but at least we'll live through it? Or moderate, where it means it's op a substantial operational impact, very costly, minor, insignificant. You get the idea. And then we're going to say, well, what's the likelihood, the probability that this happens in your organization? So almost certain, um, you know, I would venture to say that ransomware is almost certain to happen in every business. OK, the question is, what's the impact going to be on you? Or is it probable, very likely to be experienced before long, possible, unlikely or rare? Um, a global pandemic, a year ago, we would have said rare because it happens once every 100 years. Today, if you ask that question, you might say it's unlikely or possible. So that probability can change over time. So can the business impact. So the result is you get an actual numerical score. So how does that look? Here's an example of, of what you'd end up with. Um, this case, there's probably 20 items on the list. So there's no score, there's no prize for having a longer list than anyone else. The idea is um, 
to identify things that you worry about. And if you only worry about three things, then your list is three long. If you worry about 40 things, then your list is 40 long. And we determine that list from the conversation. So you can see in this example how the calculation um, plays out um, a third of the way down. Loss of internet access is unlikely to happen, but if it happened, it would be a major impact to us. So that comes out as a 20%. And I compare that to, at the very top, a data breach of confidential information, which is possible. It's actually more possible than internet going down. And the impact on my business is extreme. So that's a 62% risk. So what that means is I want to implement controls and protections and training and awareness to prevent a data breach more than I would be willing to spend time effort to ensure that my internet doesn't go down and vice versa. So you end up with this relative score and we start addressing those risks from the top as we go down. Okay. So that in a quick nutshell, is what is a IT risk assessment and how we would conduct that. So next, we have another poll that we want you to answer. Um, if you would take, again, 30 seconds to answer the poll. The question is, have you in your organization ever conducted an IT security risk assessment before? Yes or no? It's a simple question. Um, and we're counting up the votes the tabulation. Okay. Oh, a couple of more late voters. All right. Looks like everybody's probably voted now. And the results of our poll, um, about, looks like about two thirds have done some form of IT risk assessment in the past, and a third have not. Um, a caveat here is doing one seven years ago probably doesn't cut it, um, because as we said, you know, in the last six months, a whole lot of risks and threats and, and things have taken place as a result of COVID that a year ago we hadn't thought of. So it is um, probably important to do it every one or two years as your threats and your risks change. Um, so we're going to now go on and Patrick's going to tell us about the monthly security focus sessions, which is the next part of our strategy program. All right. So at this point in the program, we've had our initial meeting to get to know you and your company, learn about your company. We've also completed the risk assessment. And both of those will aid us in making recommendations on the topics and the order of topics that the monthly security focus sessions will, will take place. So say, for example, during our initial meeting, we found out that you don't have and will not be adding Wi-Fi. We'll just remove that from the list. We don't have to spend a month covering it. But then after that, in the risk assessment, maybe that showed that not having a proper firewall is your greatest risk. So that'll be covered in one of our first focus sessions. This list does not cover all of what we can discuss, but highlight some of the more frequently recommended topics. So say for example, vulnerability scanning. Do you perform vulnerability scanning? How often do you um, scan your systems? How often do you review the scans? What do you do with the scans? There's a lot of questions with that. Um, then how about incident response plan? Do you have one? Does it cover everything it should? How often is that reviewed? Um, are you in compliance with any relevant standards such as HIPAA? So then, a little bit of structure of how our meetings would go. Um, prior to the meeting, you will gather all the information on the topic and identify the attendees that will be there. So we'll share with you uh, the information that should be brought to the meeting. We'll send you all suggestions of who we think should be attend the meeting with you. Um, this allows us to have a more productive meeting and to make discussions, uh, make decisions during the meeting. So examples of some attendees that you might want for some topics. Uh, if we're talking about backups, you might want your controller there they'll be the most familiar with the type of data that needs to be backed up, how often it needs to be backed up, and how long we need to keep the backups. If we're talking about passwords, you might want your compliance officer there. They'll be familiar with all of the compliance standards that we need to adhere to. If we're talking about patching, it might just be your IT personnel. They'll know all the systems that you have, the last time they're patched, if there's a patch schedule, and that kind of thing. 
um, the owner or you yourself, you don't have to attend at every, every meeting. Any other decision maker can be there to attend in, in your place. It's really whoever's going to be the most effective at uh, helping us with that topic. So those topics will change month by month based on the topic. Or the, I'm sorry, we bring to the meeting who attends will change month by month based on the topic. So then during the meeting, these are really going to be work sessions um, where we're going to attempt to accomplish as much decision making as possible. So that way, after the meeting, we could set action into motion and start implementing changes immediately. During the meetings, what we'll do is we'll start by identifying the threats and the risk of the topic, and then we'll discuss what's currently implemented in your company, in your environment, and who's responsible for maintaining that right now. And then we'll compare your implementation to industry best practices, and that'll help us identify any gaps that you have in your, um, your security and your coverage. So then what we'll do is we'll establish what needs to change, who's gonna make changes, timelines to implement the changes, and who will maintain it moving forward because it will require maintenance. We'll have to you know, review it every so often to make sure that we're on top of it. So then after the meeting, documents will send notes from the meeting with the recommended changes, responsibilities, and timelines. That way your team has all the information you need to begin implementing the changes. Um, we will be here to assist with implementation if you ask us to. That's an additional charge. These sessions are really focused on getting you the recommendations of what needs to change. And then we will follow up with you to monitor your progress, answer questions, and then help transition to the next month's topic. So if we use uh, the topic working from home as an example, some of the things that we're gonna to wanna to know are how many users do you have and how many of them will be working from home? Is it gonna be one or two or is it gonna be all of them? Do you have a policy regarding working from home? You know, if not, how do employees know what they're supposed to do or what they're allowed to do or not do? Do you have a firewall that supports secure remote connections? Not just connecting, but secure remote connections. Do users currently have mobile devices that allow them to work from home? Or are they gonna be using personal devices or do they not have any options? Uh, a couple suggested attendees for this particular topic would be a decision maker who can write and enforce policy, an uh, IT employee who's familiar with the current technology, and then maybe a key user from your company that's not a decision maker or IT employee, but a someone who's familiar with how the system works, who can test it out and provide recommendations for us. Now, those are only as, uh, as a sample of the questions and the feedback that we would go in more depth on more. So let's continue on that same topic. And again, just a sample. Um, during our meeting, we found that maybe you have 134 users out there work from home out of 158. So not everyone's going to, but a lot will. And then you currently have no policy about it because maybe it's something you hadn't thought of or people are doing it without needing a policy. Um, you have a firewall, but it doesn't support VPN connections. And then 120 of those 134 users already have laptops, so that'll help in their ability to work from home. A couple of risks that we found are maybe children will use the computer, whether it's unintentionally, parents don't know, or maybe parents don't see the problem with children using a work computer. Um, if the employee has poor internet connection, et cetera. We will recommend writing a policy so the employees know what to do when they start working from home, purchasing the 14 needed laptops, maybe a few spares as well, purchasing a proper firewall and the licensing to get those secure connections you need, test employees' internet, make sure that prior to working from home they have the bandwidth needed, train users on risks so they can avoid them. So this may take longer than a month to implement depending on the topic and it may continue after you start the next topic. So the reason that is, is some of these things will be, you might be able to do it in a month, some it might take two or three months, there might be several people involved, it might take steps, but we'll still meet every month and go over a topic and then the implementation will be on a schedule. So the next main strategy component is employee training and testing. So why do employees need training? You know, even after addressing, discussing, and maybe implementing uh, items from the previous topics, users are really the last line of defense. So one employee taking ill-advised action still has the potential to compromise your entire system. 91% of successful data breaches start with a spear phishing attack. So let me backtrack a little bit and explain what spear phishing is in order to do that, what phishing is. Phishing is a social engineering attack that utilizes email or SMS to scam individuals into divulging sensitive information or clicking malicious links. So the next component of that is spear phishing, which targets specific people and organizations such as HR managers, lawyers, or healthcare providers. 
So in my experience, I've seen spoofed emails from a CFO or a director of finance. It looks like it's coming from them going to another employee in finance saying, hey, can you wire me money from this account to this account immediately? Or, hey, I forgot the account, how to log into this bank account. Can you send me the information? Trying to compromise your system. So 30% of data breaches are caused by repeat offenders from within the organization. So people who made the mistake will make it again. So it doesn't mean that employees are malicious or they're doing it on purpose by any means. It's really just they're not aware of what to look for in emails and to point out phish emails and require training. So we provide this training through our partner, KnowBefore. So who is KnowBefore? They are the world's largest integrated security awareness training and simulated phishing platform. Their mission is to enable your employees to make smarter security decisions every day. They're founded in 2010 in Tampa Bay, Florida. Their CEO and employees are ex-antivirus and IT security pros. They help tens of thousands of organizations manage the ongoing problem of social engineering and are winners of five consecutive Inc. 500 awards. So one-time training is not enough. Just sending someone off to watch a 20-minute video or 40-minute video even and thinking that they're forever going to know that knowledge isn't enough. The repetition is the key to reinforcing knowledge. So our trainings are regular and they're recurring. There's new content sent to employees each month and that content available for us to send is updated weekly based on current events. Training should really continue after two years. Even though strategy is a two-year program, employee training should continue after that. If new content's gonna come out that employees will be exposed to. Um, IT changes all the time, the way that attacks come in change all the time. And after that two-year window, if you hire employees, they'll require training as well. Otherwise, they're gonna be behind this and become the next vulnerability. The training is managed by us with your input. So we'll talk to you about what kind of um, items to train on. Maybe if you know that there's a specific topic your employees aren't very aware of, we can send that training out. Uh, we'll talk about how often to send training, um, that kind of thing. And then monthly reports on who completed training can be generated and sent. That way you know who's completing their training or if people aren't complaining and then saying they don't know stuff. So trainings come with a variety of topics and variety of delivery methods. Um, some of the topics are uh, the one we mentioned before, phishing and vishing. I'll talk about ransomware, which Bill mentioned in the risk assessment portion. Uh, there's also passwords and Wi-Fi mobile devices. Um, they also have compliance and HR topics. The HR topics include the New York State mandatory sexual harassment training that's offered through KnowBefore. And then they also have a variety of delivery methods, uh, including training modules, which are PowerPoint-like presentations where user can click through slides and then there's narration that read through them as well. And then um, that's actually where the definition of um, phishing and spear phishing came from in the previous slide. It was right from the know before phish awareness training module. So those quotes to be examples of what you and your employees will get during the training modules. And then there's assessments, which are short quizzes that test knowledge. Users have to get a certain percent of the questions right in order to uh, mark it complete. That just helps confirm that the training modules are effective and that they're confirming their knowledge. They also have video, uh, video modules, which are like short sitcoms. Uh, they're about five minutes long and they all have a, like a theme for each episode. So each month would be a different video and they talk about phishing or password security or, or whatever the topic is. It's a little more laid back than sitting through a training module, but it's a, it's a good follow-up for the training modules. They also offer games, which are interactive a little more fun, but they also still convey those same messages and are a good way of reinforcing the, the message being sent. And then there's newsletters and posters. Those can be printed off, hung around uh, the office if wanted. So the other component is um, employee testing. So we do this with simulated email phishing. Uh, monthly campaigns will present employees with examples of what to look for. This will send a email, it'll look like a phish email, try your employee to click on a link. If they click on it, then they get some instant feedback um, telling them they shouldn't have clicked on it, this is why you shouldn't have clicked on it, this is what you should look for in that email. Um, it's really a good way of, of reinforcing uh, what employees should be looking for. Uh, the campaigns can be customized to your company. Uh, we can create a campaign for your entire company or for individual departments or specific topics at current events 
or some mixture of them. We can do several campaigns as well. The fish testing is also managed with us with your input, just like the training. Um, that way we can ask you, you know, how many fish emails are appropriate to send your employees in a month. We don't want to spam them, but we want to send them a couple of fish attempts to get a good um, training down and get a good um, test of how they're doing. And then also like the training, there will be monthly reports on who interacted with simulated fishes. So the purpose of that, of testing with phishing is really to identify and teach employees what to look for in the future so that when they click on that link, it won't be an actual fish attempt that'll compromise you. It'll be within here and they'll learn from it and they won't do it again. It's not to shame them or discipline them. So in this graph here, it shows the fish prone percentage, which is calculated based on the number of total failures, which are clicks or attachment opens or any kind of data entry or replying to emails. And that's divided by the total number of emails delivered in that campaign. So you can see on the baseline on the left, it's nearly 38%. So without any training, um, over 4 million users compiled by Nova 4, they saw that there's a third, almost a 38% chance that employees in your company will be fish prone. So after only three month training period, it drops drastically down to 14%. And then if you continue all the way over to 12 months, you'll see it drops below 5%. So huge um, difference between 37, 38% and 5% over 12 months. And then we would continue that through the next 12 months and then hopefully from there and get that to zero or as close to zero as possible. So the combined, combined repetition of trainings and the simulated fishes is what's really gonna significantly reduce your risk over time. So next we have our final poll of the webinar. Do you have a recurring employee training and testing program? So just another yes or no, we'll give about 30 seconds. Okay, it looks like we have almost everybody. So 42% yes, 58% no. So almost almost half and half there. Um, so it's good to see some people have things implemented. Um, if not, it's definitely a thing to consider. So, um, but with that, we'll move on to build as cost the program structure. Thanks, Pat. So, just to kind of recap what we've explained, um, we've got a canned approach, um, a strategy. Well, my, our experience has been that a lot of organizations have tried um, and they just can't make progress. Or they understand that there's a cyber risk, but they can't really put their finger on what to do first or what to do next, or is it really a big enough threat? So we're trying to, to take all of those obstacles to moving forward to a secure lifestyle, a secure culture, if you will, and um, walk you through doing that so that ultimately we can walk away, um, that you've got in your organization a secure culture with, with knowing what to, to address, knowing how you're going to address it, knowing who's going to be responsible for that, and having the ability to monitor and get feedback and see that it's actually working. Um, it doesn't mean we just disappear. We're intending to be here forever and ever. Um, but the idea is it's not a commitment to you to pay us forever and ever to do something. Because frankly, we can't give you security. We can guide you through creating your own culture of security, but um, we can't sell you, quote, a security. So the idea is, how do I get you there? So in our opinion, it's going to take a little bit of time. In our, we think it's two years, um, where your employees are going to learn what they should be doing and not doing, and change their behaviors. It's going to take some practice. It's going to take some feedback. It's going to take some repetition for them to understand um, what they should and should not do and start doing it. So th so a, one chunk of our program is the know before training and testing. 
Um, and frankly, even after our project ends, after two years, we um, we think that ongoing no before training and testing should continue. That's one thing that probably never ends. Um, and part of the reason, as you saw on one of Pat's slides, that 91% of data breaches are caused by some employee mistakenly clicking on some sort of email they should not have. So that's a huge chunk of your cybersecurity. Um, the face-to-face -face or virtual meetings, so face-to-face, -face, virtual meaning uh, a Zoom meeting or go-to meeting in this COVID world, but it's not a canned um, presentation. It's us sitting down with you and having this conversation about a specific topic. Um, you saw on one of Pat's slides that there's you know, 20, 30 different topics that are of major concern as cyber threats. And frankly, you can't address them all at once. Um, the best way to eat an elephant is one bite at a time. So we're going to present those topics one bite at a time. And we think a monthly meeting is the best way to do that. Um, we, you, you and I and us, we focus on that specific topic for that month. We identify, as Pat said, what you're, what you're currently doing, what you should be doing, who's doing it, um, what should we do now, what's the new approach, what's it going to cost, how long is it going to take to implement, and we work that out and, and create a project to implement. And in, we, our belief is in mo many instances, you're going to run with that project and implement it, that you won't need us to do that. So, um, but we're available to help you implement, but that's not included in the price because, um, as I said, most organizations probably have someone available to implement many of these. So why should we charge you for that again? So it's really creating the atmosphere of focusing on one topic at a time, lead you through what are the threats, what are your risks, and how are we going to address it? So that's the face-to-face -face meeting part of it. Um, then the ongoing um, VISO, Virtual Information Security Office, we've all, you don't need to hire somebody who's an expert in cybersecurity. Um, we will be there to answer questions, to create controls, to create programs, and to educate your people how to maintain that. So, for example, backup. Are you getting a good backup? We're going to have that conversation to find out what is a good backup. What's the best way to do it? How frequently should it be done? Where does it get stored? How do you test it? Da 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 da. da. All that when that's done, someone at your organization becomes the queen of backup and makes sure that backup is done on that basis. And if something goes wrong or you get an error message, you can always call us, but we're not then doing your backup. It's you've taken that role on. So as I said, we think we think two years is kind of the minimum to get through all of these topics in a way that doesn't overwhelm you and your people to try and do 20 things at once. Um, so a two-year program, um, I mean, it, it could be a little bit longer um, if you have more topics, et cetera. But the general idea is, over two years, that's enough time for you to address these topics with us one at a time. And two years is a good long time for your employees to change their behavior and learn what they should do. And then, um, as Pat said, maybe the no before subscription carries on into the future because they're, every month it's worth reminding them what that is. So what does this all cost? So um, we've broken it down in basically three categories. Small, We call them small companies, medium companies, and bigger companies. So um, those are just names. So if your organization has up to 15 employees, um, the price is $625 per month for two years. Um, and that includes the subscription to know before for all of your employees. So each individual employee has their own subscription with training, testing, reporting, tracking built in. And that all that management of it 
we're doing as part of the program. If you have a medium-sized company, which we're identifying as 16 to 50 employees, the price is 750 a month uh, for two years. And the difference there is largely you have more employees, so the no before subscription is more because um, it's a per a per employee price. And then in our um, proposal, we're saying if you have more than 51 employees, well, let's talk about it. And the reason for that is partly because maybe you're, say, a manufacturing company with 300 employees, but 200 of them are just shop floor workers um, and don't have access to the internet or computers, so they don't really need the training. So it's not a 300 user, it's a 100 user. And um, the larger the company is, the more likely, I think, might be that it's growing. You know, you might go from 200 employees to 220 employees over the course of a year, because um, that's a 10% increase. And a small, a, a 10 user company with a 10% increase is just a one user addition. So there's a lot of dynamics going on in the in the pricing. So that's why we're saying if you're bigger than 51, we'll do a quote. But it's the same principle. The 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 charge that we're charging you is for our resources to do the um, initial risk assessment, the orientation meeting, the monthly focus sessions, and and to manage the no before training and testing. That's one part of it. And the second part of it is the actual subscription charge for no before. So that kind of gives you an idea of what we're proposing here. Um, so the next steps, um, what will happen now is we're going to send you a recording of this webinar. Um, hopefully, I mentioned that at the beginning, that we recorded this. So. Um, Probably tomorrow, um, if at the latest on Monday, we'll send you an email with an MP4 video recording of this webinar. Um, in addition, if you look on your GoTo Meeting um, menu, you'll see a, a menu choice called Handouts, and it says there's one of five available. So there's a handout there, and that is the slide deck of these slides that we've shown you. So it's a PDF that you can download and print off. Um, the purpose of that, in our opinion, is you can share this concept with other people in your organization who may not have been on this call. So if you think this is a really good idea, but you need to get somebody else's feedback and buy-in, then um, you can say, well, here, watch this webinar video. Or here's the slides. Let me t take 10 minutes and walk you through what I heard and what it said. Um, and therefore, you can develop whatever questions you might have or any um, special requests or whatever that happens to be. And, and we can talk about those um, with you one on one. So if you want if you'd like further information or if you want to schedule a meeting to discuss it specifically, what we would do with you and your organization, what it would cost. If you're looking for a quote, if you're a larger organization and you want that, any of that stuff, um, reach out to Pat. Um, his email is on here, prost at dopkins.com and the phone number. And um, Pat would be happy to answer those questions and we'll um, get you any information we can. And hopefully we can um, work together to um, build a secure culture in your organization. Um, so we now, as I promised at the beginning, left uh, time for uh, questions. And I said 10 minutes, and it looks like almost exactly 10 minutes. Um, so if anyone has any questions, um, if you'd like to type them into the question screen, um, we would be... Um, more than happy to answer them if we can. Um, no, none are there yet, but um, so um, here's a question that's come up is um, what happens if the, um, the program is based on the size of my organization and partway through the two years, my size changes? So what that means is um, we start this program and you have 15 employees. So we're 
charging you the 15 employee rate and a year in you hire four people and it's now 19 employees and that changes the thing. So the real difference there is individual um, subscription charges per employee for no before. So we can, um, you know, compute that additional cost um, of whatever that is, um, uh, a couple of hundred dollars a year, and your monthly charge might go from um, $625 up to $670 or something like that. So we would recompute that um, as it goes forward. Um, so it really is only going to be an issue, I think, if you're um, right on the cusp of that size and you change. So a um, question came in, um, is there any additional cost for a virtual CISO or is that included in the risk assessment monthly meetings component of the program? Yes, that's our intention is that it's included um, in the, the program. So what that means is we're guiding you through the risk assessment. That would be typically a, a virtual CISO's role, a CISO would do that. So we'll perform that role. We're going to facilitate the monthly meetings um, and focus on the security issues. So that is something that your CISO would typically do. And then if there are specific questions that come up outside of the scope of those meetings, um, we would encourage you to call us and we would answer those questions. Um, What's not included is, um, all right, I want you, Dopkins, to get me a new firewall and set it up and configure it. Um, we certainly can do that, but that's not built into the price because that's not what everybody necessarily will need. So um, we would be um, prepared to, to guide you through this program and answer other questions and give advice actual implementations beyond that scope would be a separate quote. Um, and as I said earlier, in our opinion, many organizations will already have, um, you know, someone, in the example I gave of a firewall, you probably already have an IT provider and you would go to that IT provider and say, sell me a firewall and configure it. And that's what they would do. Um, so we would, in our monthly meeting, address what that firewall should accomplish, um, what filters it should have, et cetera, and that would help direct that IT resource to select the right one, the right model, the right brand, and to implement it and how to configure it. But that would be uh, an act that our guess is most people would have a resource that would be able to address that. So um, so we don't believe there's an additional cost for that virtual CISO function uh, included in the cost. And frankly, we think that over the course of that two-year period, we're addressing what we see to be the top 20 plus big issues. So we're actually coming to you with, here's the things you should be thinking about, not waiting for you to stumble upon a risk and come to us and say, what should I do? So um, so I, we don't think that there's a whole lot of virtual information security officer work to be done outside of those meetings anyway, because we think that's what covers the, the issue. But we're certainly available to provide that. Hopefully that answers the question. Um, anyone else have any other questions or ideas or suggestions or can you tell me something? If we, we have, um, by my watch, five minutes left. If there aren't any further questions, um, we can give you back five minutes of your life to be spent as you so choose. Um, any, um, as I said, we'll reach out to you. Um, you'll get an email in the next day or two with uh, the um, the video. You, hopefully you've downloaded the PDF of the slides if you want it. And you have our contact information, both Pat and I, if there's any questions, um, if you'd like to 
talk more specifically about how the program applies to you, please reach out and give us a call. Um, we'd be more than happy to answer those questions. So with that, I will say thank you everyone for your time and attention um, and for listening to our program of strategy, a strategy for getting started. Thank you all and have a good afternoon. <laughs>